getting no There we go. Good job. All right. Um, well, thank you everyone for, for being here. <laughs> really appreciate it. I know it's a, a hot night, so it's a good night to be indoors, that's for sure. I'm um, really glad to be able to make this sort of rescheduled version of Books and Bites um, virtually. So unfortunately, no bites to share, um, <laughs> but some interesting stories to share for sure. Um, so our author this evening is Nina Sankovic. Uh, and this is, a, you know, big thanks to the friends of the Belmont Public Library for making all of our events online possible. But especially when we have authors, um, we're so lucky to have the ability to do them on Zoom now and, and have the authors who might be not so not so far away as Nina is, but not, not necessarily right around the corner either. It really extends our reach. Um, so a little bit about Nina, as we were just talking earlier, a well-known face to the library, very glad to have her back. Um, and she's the author of several nonfiction books, obviously, if she's been to the library, mm -hmm. uh, including American Rebels and the Lowells of Massachusetts, which has a very strong tie, obviously, to the greater Boston area. She's written uh, for the New York Times, the Huffington Post as a contributing blogger and was formerly a judge of the Book of the Month Club and also local uh, back in, I assume, undergrad. Oh, and, and grad, sorry, I did not realize you went to Harvard Law too. Um, she's a graduate of Tufts University and Harvard Law School and grew up in uh, Evanston, Illinois and currently lives in Connecticut with her family. And we're gonna be hearing a little bit about signed, Signed, sealed, yeah. <laughs> delivered, and the uh, celebrating the joys of letter writing. So without further ado, okay. you take it away. Well, thank you, Lauren. Thank you so much. And thank you to the Friends of Belmont Library for, for um, funding this program. It is a pleasure to be back at Belmont Library, although I'm not exactly back, but back on screen. And uh, I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so that I can get my slideshow going. Um, let's hope that works. Yeah, there you go. There's a stack of letters. I'm going to explain where these letters came from. So years ago, I discovered these letters um, along with about, um, well, I'd say a good 70 other bundles just like that. And I discovered these 70 or so bundles of letters in a rotting old trunk that was in my backyard. It was a new house. Well, it's actually a very old house, but it was new to me. My husband and I had just bought this very old house in need of a lot of repairs, so many repairs. Um, we hadn't really paid a lot of attention to the backyard of this house when we purchased it. It was a townhouse in New York City. You don't really look at the backyard that much. We knew there was a shed back there. We thought we'd just be tearing that down. Um, but we went out to the shed, took a look inside, and there was a, an, it's like old steamer trunk, um, the kind you read about, you know, in Edith Wharton novels, that someone's going away for months and months and they have a steamer trunk full of clothes. But this steamer trunk was full of letters just a lifetime's worth of letters, bundles and bundles, as you can see, tied up like this with string um, or with ribbons. Um, I think I've got another, there we go. Uh, here's another, and this is an actual ribbon, again, from, from, the, from the trunk. Most of the letters, as you can see, most of the letters uh, were still in their envelopes. Some of them had notes scrawled across the top of them. Um, they almost all had like a date on the back of them about when they'd been received. For example, the first one I pulled out read, received April 4th, 98. That was 1898. When I realized these were letters that were more than 100 years old, I just couldn't believe it. Um, and we contacted the person, you know, our realtor, and tried to contact the seller, but the seller said this actually wasn't our family and we're not interested in the letters and you take them. And so I took them. Um, and my husband and I, we, we, uh, we, we moved into this crumbling old house, we fixed it up and there was a lot of time um, that went by before I really started delving into the mystery of this letters, where they had come from, who, was the, who, was the, who had they been addressed to, who was this um, you know, person who had saved so many letters. And, um, what I found out was that, uh, let me go to my next slide. So in this trunk of letters, um, 
I not only found in this trunk of letters, I not only found letters, I found this newspaper. And the newspaper announces the wedding. So it's a brilliant wedding. It's the wedding of a woman named Addie Bernheimer, and she married a man named DeWitt Seligman. And as I looked through the letters, it turned out that most of the letters and all of the letters were really addressed to Addie, either Miss Addie Bernheim or Miss Addie Bern, Mrs. Addie Bernheim Seligman or Mr. and Mrs. DeWitt Seligman. These were the letters that this woman had accumulated um, over her life. Um, many of them written by her husband, and I'll get later to, to who else wrote a lot of the letters, but I wanna tell you a little bit more about Addie. So this is her wedding announcement. And um, not only did I find this in the trunk, but I also found a glass plate photograph of Addie and DeWitt on their honeymoon. So here they are in Niagara Falls and they are on their honeymoon. I'm gonna go close up so you can see, here they are. They don't look that happy to be on their honeymoon, but there they are. And Addie is wearing this beautiful little bonnet. And I also found in the trunk, the bonnet that she wore on her honeymoon. And it looks as fresh as the day she wore it. Look at those are silk flowers, silk violets, and they're just beautiful. So all of these artifacts in this trunk just were so entrancing to me. Just, it's incredible that this trunk had come to me. And the best part of all was still to come because I had all of these letters to read, all of these letters to, to, to go through and find out more about Addie and do it. Well, I slowly started to figure things out. I did also some Google searching to find out more about Addie and DeWitt. They had three children. Ethel was their oldest, and she was my connection to this house because she was the first owner, along with her husband, of this townhouse. Um, then they had a middle child, another girl named Alma, and their youngest was a boy, a boy named James. Youngest child, only son, he was clearly adored by his mother. In fact, most of the letters in the trunk are the letters that James wrote to his mother. There are some lovely letters from her husband. This is a really funny one that he wrote to her um, when they were just first expecting their very first child. And he writes to her, my darling wifey, a responsibility will soon be upon you. It will be a baby, <laughs> a little bit of a thing which you can put in your pocket or stick up your nose. I mean, this letter is so funny. Um, he goes on to give advice to Addie about how she should raise the child. Um, let's see, prevent the child from eating foie gras the first three days of life. By the sixth day, though, the child can play baseball. And by the 10th day, the kid can run for Congress. It is such a funny letter. And what I love about it is it, it seems so contemporary in, in the humor, um, in the ease with which he's writing to his wife, but also gives us real insight into the family dynamics, into the love between this couple and how excited they are about having a child. Um, there's just a charming letter, but as I say, most of the letters in the trunk were written by James from about the time he was four years old, which was 1894, he was four years old, until the time of Addie's death in 1937. Here are some examples of letters he wrote when he was very young. <laughs> and most of the letters, so hundreds of letters I found that James wrote to his mother and almost every one of those letters was signed, your loving son, James. Now during the four years that James was at Princeton, he was there from 1908 to 1912. He wrote to his mother as often as three times a day, a day. See, the mail came in the morning and also in the afternoon. It went out in the morning and also in the afternoon. So he wrote to his mother, he just these little postcards generally, um, just to kind of fill her in on his day. My, my favorite letters, um, as I said, are, are the ones that, um, like, let me go back because I want to talk a little bit about, um, so here are his early letters again. Now he kept, I'm gonna talk more about his college letters, but I also wanna say that even after he got out of college, he continued to write to his mother. So even, you know, he got married, he had a career, he traveled the world. And this is one of the letters that I have here. You can see he's aboard the Mauritania writing to his mother. I mean, it's just incredible, these old letters. And 
the letters of when he traveled with his wife, um, the letters of when he traveled before he was married, they're all very fun and interesting. But the letters that I love are the ones he wrote from college. So he just loved college. He got there. He'd been sort of, I, I got a sense he was a very pampered child in New York City. He gets out to Princeton. All of a sudden, he's pretty free to do what he wants. And he has fun. He has so much fun. Um, he, he had such an appetite for experience, for, for pleasure, you know, some a bit for classes. He, he writes in one of his letters, I'm getting a good college education, developing like a film, apologizing to the grass every time I step on it, scrambling like an egg, yelling like a bear, telling the upperclassmen to go to hell. <laughs> Studying did not interest him very much. He writes in one letter, I will study later after my nap. And fun was just to be had in everywhere he went. He, he said, he wrote to his mother, I saw the game with Penn last night. This is Princeton playing Penn. I think it was a basketball game. It was interesting. The game, oh no, the girl I was sitting next to. Here is his college photograph. Uh, Princeton was able to locate that for me and sent it to me. So a very typical college student. He always seemed to be in need of money. He wrote in one letter, my supply of cash is almost extinct. I haven't opened a bank account as you advised me not to. So that's how the math stands. Um, the latest is a player of black garters. So blew myself to a pair. Hint, hint, send more money. I bought some garters and I need to pay for them. Um, and guess what? Money was sent. And he writes back when he receives money. He's very polite. He says, I cashed your first check found very little trouble in cashing it. In fact, if you have any more checks you need cashed, kindly forward the same and I will oblige. So he's just a very charming young man. And four years of college later, he's still happy for the checks. He writes in a letter senior year, your letter and your check couldn't have possibly been more welcome, especially the latter. If you send a check with every letter, write as often as you want, twice a day if necessary. I, ha I really have to give credit to James for, for being so funny about asking for money, being appreciative when he gets it, um, and just for being the kind of college kid that I, could, I could, could completely relate to, even though he was in college 100 years before my kids were in college. So my kids are going off to college. This is uh, quite a bit later after I found the letters of James Seligman, and, and I wondered, are they going to write to me when they go to college? And it made me think about these letters that James had written. It made me think about why did Addie, his mother, say these letters? And why did I want my children to write me letters? What is it about letters that makes them so special? I wanted to define the qualities that make them special. Um, I mean, I really doubted that my son was going to write to me, but I thought I could write a book about why letters are so important. Maybe it will convince him to write to me. So to answer that question about why letters are so important and what are their specific and singular qualities um, that make them such a great form of communication. So to answer those questions, I researched back through thousands of years of letter writing. And I mean thousands, because I'm gonna tell you about letters that are thousands of years old. I went through my own correspondence, so that's only like, you know, a few decades old. Um, and I went and letters that had been sh shared with me by friends and family, letters of their own that they had saved and wanted me to see. I also researched in university and town archives. I went through historical collections and libraries and published collections of letters. And in my book, Science Seal Delivered, Celebrating the Joys of Letter Writing, in that book, that came out of my research and my intense hunt for the exact qualities of letters that make them so vital. I identify the specific qualities of letters that I found, and I illustrate those qualities by telling stories. Stories of these letters, stories of who wrote them, stories of why, stories of who received them, stories from my own history, but also from ancient history all the way to contemporary history. Now, the quality of letters that I identify, um, I'm just going to go over a few of them. Well, for example, the privacy. A letters afford incredible privacy. Um, the uniqueness of every letter. Every letter is different. They're written to a specific recipient. 
Letters offer proof. They offer proof of love, of danger, of commitment, of friendship. Reading letter allows us to be a fly on the wall of the life of the letter writer, to experience what they have experienced, how they have um, experienced it. Letters offer grace and generosity, for example, in the thank you letters and condolence letters that we write. These kinds of letters mean so much to the people who receive them because it, it shows them we've taken the time to remember their loved one or to remember some kind thing they did for us and to, to share those memories with the person who has lost someone important to them or with someone who's gone out of their way to do something nice for us. Letters are also a very effective way of offering advice, especially to a teenage person. Um, you need that sort of space and time. If you write advice out on a letter and hand it to someone, they can take that letter away and, and be private with it. And, and it's kind of let the advice absorb and then respond. There's not that sort of confrontation. Are you going to take my advice? No, there's time. Um, that's a beautiful thing about letters. It's the time involved in sending them off, receiving them, answering them. And I'm going to talk a little bit about more about that later too. Um, letters are a bridge between the past and present, between ourselves and others. Letters allow us to be in history, to be in the past, part of the past. As a historian, this means so much to me because letters allow me to actually understand what was really going on. It's an eyewitness firsthand account of what was going on at the time of history that I'm interested in. As I say, I went back thousands of years. The ancient Egyptians were the, where I started. I started with the ancient Egyptians because the ancient Egyptians wrote thousands of letters to each other. Now, this is amazing because only a tiny percentage of Egyptians could read or write. But professional scribes offered reading and writing, writing, reading and writing services for a price and for those people who couldn't afford the prose, well, they would hit up on their, you know, their educated friends or relatives. And again and again, they did this because there are thousands of letters that the Egyptians wrote and they've been discovered um, and they cover almost all periods of the Egyptian kingdoms. The importance of letters in ancient Egypt can be seen in the advice um, sent by a professional scribe to his young apprentice. And I, I just love this uh, quote. I put it up on my Instagram today because it's just such a great quote for anybody interested in writing. He's talking specifically about writing as a scribe. Apply yourself to this noble profession. You will find it useful. Love writing, shun dancing. Then you become a worthy official. Befriend the scroll, the palette. It pleases more than wine. Writing pleases more than bread and beer, more than clothing and ointment. It is worth more than an inheritance in Egypt, than a tomb in the West. All of the Egyptian letters I read included the language, it is good if the Lord takes note. This phrase to me, I took as an acknowledgement of the importance of the written message and the gratitude in having it read and then acted upon. In other words, it's kind of offering of thanks. And these messages of thanks didn't only go to the living. The ancient Egyptians wrote to their dead relatives. They did this all the time. And they expressed thanks to their dead relatives for all that was done by them when they were alive. And then they asked for a little more help from the great beyond saying, Hey, help me when you were alive. Now I really need your help, even though you're dead. It is good if the Lord takes note of all the help you're going to give me. So clearly, the ancient Egyptians expected that in gratitude for a letter well written, the asked for favor would be carried out, even from beyond the grave. Now, perhaps one of the strongest qualities of a letter is how it builds a bridge. With the Egyptians, it builds a bridge between the ancient, the times of ancient Egypt and, and modern times. We can understand what life was like in ancient Egypt. Letters also create a bridge between those who are far away from us in the present time. 
Most of us, for example, missed uh, the presence of family members and friends during our COVID-19 quarantine times. One way to reach them during the quarantine was to write them a letter. Letters written to friends and family are just unique and singular communications. They're so specific to the person to whom you are writing. They're written with care and time and attention. When we write a letter, we are actually creating a moment in, in time between us and the person to whom we write. When we send it off, what's wonderful is we send it off. We don't expect an immediate response. We've created a moment, we've sent it off, and now we let time go by. This is so unlike what we expect and hope for with our emails or our texts. We, we don't check for updates or changes in status when we send up a letter. We go back to our lives and we do things so that we can have more to write about in our next letter. The privacy afforded by letters is also important um, when so many other forms of communication are, are under surveillance. When we write a letter, we expect it to be for one person only. We write freely and openly, and we share what's in our heart. Legally, our letters are protected. To mess with a US mail is a felony offense. Practically, we can also protect our letters, hiding them um, or destroying them if we don't want anyone to find them. In 1578, the poet Sir Philip Sidney worried that his father's personal secretary was reading the letters Philip sent home. He wrote a note directly to the secretary, warning him against violating the sanctity of letters. He wrote, if I ever know you do so much as read any letter I write to my father without his commandment or my consent, I will thrust my dagger into you. That's a warning. One of the letters which Addie Seligman had in her trunk had a note scrawled across its envelope. They all had notes, but this one was a very specific note. It said, nobody to read this. So it was written on the outside of the envelope. Well, when I saw those scrawled words, I confess, it only made me want to read that letter more. I mean, I respect the privacy of letters, but I wanted to know what was so terrible in the letter that reading it had to be forbidden by Addie. It had a postmark of Deauville, France, um, 1923. And I figured, come on, it's an old letter. Any scandal or horror it contains is long past. These old letters were part of history now. And I couldn't stop myself. I'm a historian. I opened the letter and I read it. I did. What I found inside was a bit of gossip about Peggy Guggenheim, who is a, was a cousin of James. Uh, she was the daughter of the wealthy banker, Benjamin Guggenheim, who was married to James' father's sister, Florette. Now, Benjamin and Florette went down on the Titanic, leaving to their daughter, Peggy, a considerable fortune and the freedom to do whatever she wanted. And what she wanted to do was collect art and men, go to parties, have a good time. So James had written a letter to his mother about running into his cousin Peggy, saying he had met her at some party in Europe and wrote that she was chaperoning a weird looking man who may or may not be the father of her child. Well, the weird looking man, I did a little research. I think the weird looking man was probably Lawrence Vale, who was a Dada sculptor and free spirit who became Guggenheim's first husband um, and was indeed the father of two of her children. So I'm not sure if Addie's scandal, her concern was linked to the uncertainty of who were the, was the parent of Peggy's child or how weird Lawrence Bell was. But whatever it was, Addie did not want anyone to read the letter. But if she didn't want anyone to read the letter, why didn't she destroy it? This raises an even larger question. Why did she save all of the letters that James wrote her over all of those years? 
even a letter that she thinks contains this shameful family secret. What is it about letters that demand such devoted preservation? I've lost many letters over the years. I've destroyed some old letters, I love letters I didn't want around anymore. Um, I know I, there are letters from my family that I have packed in boxes somewhere. I'm not sure where they are, but, but I know exactly where to find every single note, drawing, card, letter, made for me or sent to me over the years by my children. I store them all in a green metal trunk on the second floor landing of my house. There it is, there's the trunk. I walk by that morning, every morning, when I go down to start my day, and every night when I head back to bed. This green trunk is a constant reminder for me of all the joy my children have brought me. Even now, they're grown up. My youngest is 20 now. But their letters, their childhood, their, their beings as children and the wonderful times we had, that's all still with me because it's all still in that trunk for me in all these letters. And I think Addie saved every letter from James, even the one about Peggy Guggenheim, to preserve moments she had shared with her son. Moments of letters written and letters read. She wanted to be able to go back again and again to share the moments again and again of having James beside her. A joint correspondence, this preserved connection is a lasting gift. I donated all the letters that James wrote while he was at Princeton to the Princeton Archives located in the Seely G. Mudd Memorial, no, Manuscript Library, Seely G. Mudd Manuscript Library. After donating them, um, I heard from one of the librarians there that he had given the job of archiving the letters to a, uh, to a young student, a young undergraduate who was going to go into archival sciences. And he wrote to me that this young student pronounced the treasure trove of letters awesome. And she thinks he's so funny. And then this uh, librarian wrote to me, she is 105 year, years younger than James Seligman, but I think he's gaining another admirer. And I understand exactly how this young student felt. I'm also an incredible admirer of James Seligman and all because his mother saved the letters I found the letters and I read the letters. And so James Seligman still is alive and his moments of, of humor and, and, and just his crazy life are still available to anyone who wants to read his letters. Jack Trice was the first black student to play football for Iowa State College. During his first major game against the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis in October 1923, Trice suffered a broken collarbone in the first quarter. Despite the pain, Trice refused to sit it out. He played on through, through to the third quarter when he was thrown on his back and deliberately trampled on by three Minnesota players in what many saw as a race motivated attack. Trice was taken off the field and sent to the hospital. Doctors declared him fit to travel back to Iowa. But two days later, Jack Trice died as a result of the injuries he received during the game with Minnesota. He left behind a family, a fiance, and the over 4,000 fellow students and faculty who attended his funeral, shaken by shock and grief. Just before Trice was buried, a letter was found in the pocket of his suit jacket. It was a letter he'd written to himself the night before the Minnesota game. My thoughts just before the first real college game of my life, the honor of my race, family, and self is at stake. Everyone is expecting me to do big things and I will. Be on your toes every minute if you expect to make good. He signed the letter, Jack. The football stadium of Ohio State University is now called the Jack Trice Stadium. In front of the stadium, there's a bronze statue of Trice standing with one knee up, foot resting on a ledge, head bent down, reading the letter he holds in his hand, the letter he wrote to himself for his last game. That is the history 
that we find in letters. That is the legacy of letters. In 1998, a burial ground in South Korea was excavated to make way for new housing. During excavation of the tombs, a burial chamber was unearthed and a letter that had been placed with the occupant came to light. This letter was over 400 years old, written by a wife to her dead husband in the 16th century. The letter read in part, you used to tell me that we would live together until our hairs turn gray and we would die together. How come you forget that and go away and leave me behind? Take me with you now because I cannot live after losing you and I want to follow your way. My grief is endless. My heart is so torn apart. It was a common practice in Korea at that time to bury family letters with the body of the deceased. In this tomb, there were 17 other letters written to the dead man. But it is the wife's letter that seems so alive and so vibrant. She's tugging on our sleeves today for an answer to our question, why did he leave me? Read this carefully, she writes, come to me in my dreams and tell me all. I believe I will see you in my dreams. Most of the letters I read today were written long ago. I have to say, I, don't, I received letters, I'd say about on a weekly basis, but the hundreds of letters that I read during a year of research as a historian, of course, come from people who wrote them long ago. There are letters that I find in library collections and historical archives, old books. Through these letters, I meet people, some of them who I've heard of, like, uh, of course, this wonderful letter written by Vincent van Gogh. You can tell it's him by that um, wonderful little drawing. He, he wrote this letter to his brother and you, I could write a whole book about, and people have, so I don't need to, but people have written whole books about the correspondence between Vincent van Gogh and his brother, Theo, who really kept him going, and, and Theo's wife really kept him going, and their letters are just a joy to read. For my last book, American Rebels, How the Hancock, Adams, and Quincy Families Fan the Flames of Revolution, I had to dig into the letters of, of people we all know pretty well. Um, John Hancock, John Adams, Abigail Smith Adams. My book is about how those two Johns, John Hancock, John Adams, and Abigail, along with Dolly Quincy Hancock, Josiah Quincy, and other early activists for American independence, well, they all came, they spent their childhoods in Braintree, Massachusetts. Um, Abigail Adams was from the town over, but she spent most of her time with her grandmother who lived in Braintree. And they formed deep connections, the, this group of young people, connections that lasted into childhood, connections that they shared through letters that I read, connections which help us understand today how they had the courage to, to seek independence from England, to rise up in the 1760s and 70s and declare independence for the American colonies. In researching that book, I read through stacks and stacks and stacks of old letters. I got headaches trying to decipher the, uh, the curse of writing. It's, it's beautiful writing, but it is hard on the eyes. I combed through seemingly endless microfiches of old letters, which is really a hard way to read a letter, um, all in search of these connections between the members of the Hancock, Adams, and Quincy families. I was a research fellow of the Massachusetts Historical Society. So I had access to the most fantastic collection of the letters themselves. To be able to see them um, was just amazing. And really uh, for anybody interested in American history and in family relationships and political movements and daily life of the 18th and 19th century in America, for anyone interested in humanity, period, the letters of John Adams and Abigail Adams and their extended family are just amazing, wonderful to read. Um, I especially, of course, love the letters between John and Abigail through their courtship, which started in the 1760s, and through their the life that they shared until Abigail died in 1818. So here's uh, here's them um, around the time of their marriage. In John Adams' very first letter to Abigail, sent through uh, her sister Mary, who was engaged to be married to a close friend of John, 
John Adams made a joke about King George, who who just come to the throne. He was a young, handsome king. Um, and he makes a joke about how Abigail better not be having a crush on this young king. And it's so funny to think how, you know, John Adams makes a joke about rebelling against the king because in this context, he doesn't want Abigail to have a crush when in fact, he's going to go ahead and seriously rebel against the king in another 15 years or so. Um, in this letter, the 1761 letter, he teases Abigail, warning her against becoming a most loyal subject to young George. For if Abigail were to show too much favor to George, although my allegiance has hitherto been inviolate, I shall endeavor in all my power to foment rebellion. I mean, how incredibly fitting are those words, given what was to come. Well, from that time on, from that very first letter, you know, the letters flowed back and forth between John and Abigail. She was then spending most of her time in Weymouth. Um, John's actually in Braintree, but he was also all over the place, um, teaching, um, teaching and then studying law. Um, but the love letters flowed between them. They had these little names for each other. John called Abigail Miss Adorable. Um, she professed herself bound to him by a threefold cord of humanity, friendship, and physical attraction. And the physical attraction comes through in the letters. Uh, John demands as many kisses and as many hours of your company as possible. And Abigail replies with the endearment of my friend, my friend John, which is a term of considerable intimacy in the, 17th, in the 18th century. One letter she wrote ended with, accept this hasty scrawl warmed from my heart. Here is that letter. And you can see it's signed Diana. So this was another, uh, she went by Diana. He went by Lysander. Lysander was a heroic Spartan admiral. Diana was the Roman goddess of moon and hunting. So they had these cute little names for each other. Now I was able to see the actual letters written by John and Abigail, but what is amazing, and I recommend this for everyone, you, anyone can go to the Massachusetts Historical Society website and see all of their letters digitized um, and also transcribed, meaning you can really understand what the letters are about. You don't have to try to figure out the handwriting. I mean, I still make it part of my weekly routine to just go onto the site, put in a word, like I'll do a word search, clouds or spring or geese, and I discover a new letter written by John or Abigail that I'd never seen before. Here's one that she wrote to him in 1777, and it's just a very lovely letter. Um, I've looked back, as I say, over a millennia of letter writing to understand the particular and wonderful qualities of letters that make them such an enduring method of communication. And I found so many reasons to write a letter, to build a bridge across time and space, to communicate freely and in privacy, to create proof, to create a unique and singular document. Why do I read letters? I obviously read letters that are sent to me because they're sent to me. And I read the letters in historical collections and book collections and, and all over. I read those letters because of the vital living link. As a historian, it's so important for me to find that link between the present and the past. And that's what letters do. But even more, I have to say, what really draws me are letters like the, the you know, these letters that Abigail writes to John Adams or just to see tenderness and kindness, um, to see someone try to give advice, to see someone try to leave a legacy, to explain red letters where a man is trying to explain to his son what he did in the war so he can always know what did your father do in the war. And love. I, I see so much love in letters and I find that very heartening. I'm going to close with a letter written by John Hancock to his beloved Dolly Quincy, pledging his love forever. So here it is. It's a uh, copy there. And um, so it started all my love to my dear aunt. So uh, that was Aunt Lydia with whom Dolly was staying. Um, and believe me, my dear, what I profess to be yours or hope to be, profess to be, hope to be, yours forever, John Hancock. And he had to wait a long time. He had to wait 11 years to marry Dolly Quincy. They finally did get married in August of 1775 in a house just, just up the road from where I live now. 
The house was burned down by the British during the war and then rebuilt in part with money paid for, uh, paid, partly paid by John Hancock. Um, but it's not the same house and Dolly and John are clearly all long gone, although we still have their portraits. Um, but we have their letters and they are alive because we have their letters. Their letters remain, they are a bridge to the past, the proof of their love and a wonderful window into humanity, past and present. We live in a digital age, we're very busy, we want answers quickly, we shoot up texts and emails expecting quick responses. And there is so much to be said to be able to communicate this way. But there are qualities of letter writing that resonate, qualities that I found while researching my book. And I hope you make time to read my book, to find the stories of people throughout history who wrote letters, received letters. I mean, from Abraham Lincoln, who had to write a lot of condolence letters during the Civil War. Um, Arthur Ashe, the letters that his, um, that his wife received after he died. I went up to uh, a, um, a collection um, that's held at the library, a library in Harlem and just hundreds and hundreds of letters expressing their grief over the loss of Arthur Ashe, just incredible. Um, letters Gertrude Stein wrote, wrote, letters that Eloise and Abbott, you know, an abbess in what was it, 14th century France, the letters that she wrote. Um, I look at, uh, I don't know if you all remember the MASH episode in which uh, the different uh, people living there in Korea during the war write home to uh, their family at Christmas time. It's an incredibly moving episode. <laughs> um, the letters that Emily Dickinson wrote, I mean, all of these stories come together to show that letters are proof of love, of connection, of history. The privilege of writing and receiving letters is just not one to be taken for granted. So if you want to make a connection, leave a legacy, just reach out and make someone's day, write a letter. Thank you. I'll be happy to answer any questions now about letter writing or my book or anything at all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nina. That was um, fascinating. I was just flipping through some of the this, the parts that I had sort of forgotten about, which some of which you touched on, um, the Eloise being the nun, right? If, is she yeah, well, nun? she ended up being an abbess, but she started out as a nun, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was, I mean, I thought that was, um, so one of the things that I thought was really interesting is, and I'd love to hear your perspective on it too, is, you know, you're right, we definitely attribute a certain amount of confidentiality, not just because it's the law, but like, in general, <laughs> right? I love that slide, though. It's like felony. <laughs> yeah. And it's true. I mean, people, you know, it is a it's, it's a serious crime. And it's interesting to see that. It seems to me that we, um, so there's something about the paper format, it seems to be that people take it a little bit more um, seriously than like giving away their information online in very right. free ways. And then it's so much easier to, you know, break that confidentiality. Do you feel, do you think it's something about like the actual mode of writing on a, a physical piece of paper? Um, I, I, I mean, I don't, I don't have an answer there, but. Um, right. Yeah, that's a good, I mean, I do think so. I think we're so used to just like banging on the email and we kind of expect this could be forwarded or we should know. <laughs> I always tell my kids, you know, your emails can be forwarded to, you don't know where they're going to be forwarded. And yeah, sure, someone could show a letter, but I think it would, most of us would be like, really? I don't think you should show me your letter. Whereas we have no problem sort of looking at emails that are forwarded to us. There's something about the paper, about the envelope. It's that you, know, you fold the paper, you put in an envelope. There is that that sort of aura of protection and of privacy that um, that's ascribed to a letter. And, and part of it is just the very physicality of it. It's an object. It's not just something on your screen. It's an actual object. I'm just going to turn this light on. I'm so dark out. <laughs> so oh, there we go. It's always a strange time of year when the sun yeah. is realized like all of a sudden like, oh, the sun is setting much yeah. earlier. Than much it was. earlier, oh my yeah. gosh. Um, Christine has a, a question. Uh, do you write letters differently since you have done all of this research? Like, does it 
do you feel like knowing how letters are written or the history of letter writing, has that affected the way that you communicate via the letter? Yes, it definitely has. And sometimes it's just too, it's almost like a burden. I mean, if I, I write a lot of uh, thank you letters or just letters to friends, I feel like, okay, this really has to be good. You know, it's, and, um, and that makes it different from an email too, because an email, you can kind of edit it as you're doing it. A letter, you really have to think about it before you start writing it because you don't want to have to scratch anything out or rewrite it. So I think there's a real thoughtfulness that goes into letters. And then now knowing how much I value letters that I receive and how I save them, it is, you know, it is something to think, well, I'm, this may be something that someone keeps for a long time. I better make sure my writing is, is legible. Um, I write coherently. I'm spelling everything correctly. There's no spell check when you write a letter. So I think it has changed the way I write letters. And it has made me so much more appreciative of receiving letters from people. I just, I just love it. I love getting letters. And I, and I always write back because I just think it's, it's such a, a wonderful way to, to create a connection. Um, I had another quick question with, unless somebody else is going to pop in here, but I, I was just thinking about the difference. Um, I'd read a different book that's more about self-care, maybe a couple of months ago. Uh, it was written by somebody who I think is still an executive at Comedy Central. So she's got a, a funny bent, but one of the things that she does is a matter of self-care, but also caring of, for her friends group to really strengthen the ties as she writes um, cards. And and I was thinking about like how you're right. A lot of those same things apply in terms of a, a card versus a letter. But I wonder sometimes cards, um, do you think that there's a difference? And does that, does that influence? Because I think there is something different about, like I write a lot of cards, right? But I don't know how necessarily for myself last time I really wrote a letter. Um, do you feel like there's a difference there for you as well in terms of how you approach them? I think it's true that I receive many more cards than just letters. Um, what's interesting is to see how some people, they really use the text of the card. That's their message. You know? <laughs> um, and then other people who fill in every last part of the card. So you're not even sure what was the actual you know, uh, message that you paid for with that card. Um, I think it makes it easier for some people to write cards. It's just, uh, it's, um, it's very non-intimidating to open a card. Like, oh, a card is fun. A letter can be a little intimidating to receive because we don't receive them that much anymore. So I do think that people felt, oh, I got a letter. Oh, I have to reply to a letter. I'm not sure there's that same feeling mm -hmm. of reciprocity when you get a card. Um, like you wouldn't write back to a thank you card. I mean, to a birthday card, you wouldn't write back to a thank you card either <laughs> or a condolence card really. So there is something um, that makes it a, a, a memento, but not one that is implying a continuing chain of communication. Um, I have a friend who sends postcards to all of her friends when she travels and she travels a lot and she writes a lot of postcards. And that's a real commitment for her because she says she tries to make every postcard different, but she's writing to like 10 different friends from let's say the Grand Canyon. There are how many different ways can you describe the Grand Canyon? But she says she does it. Um, she's a writer and maybe for her, it's a kind of exercise in writing. You know, how many different ways can I describe the Grand Canyon? Uh, but I do like that, I, that idea of, of writing cards, friends. And I love it. Once in a while, I'll get a very unexpected card from a friend where you know, it will be like a funny picture. We, I thought of you when I saw this card. And I like that. It's very nice. It's very thoughtful to get a card like that. Yeah. Blank cards with the funny photo, I think, are, um, they're more like a, they're like a writing prompt. They're the most letter, -like, yeah. letter like version of a card I could possibly yeah. imagine. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting. Um, does anybody else have any, any questions? Ah, Christine has. Oh. Were you a kid who had pen pals? Did you have a pen pal when you were younger? Well, I, I had um, cousins who lived in Belgium. And I was in the Midwest and um, they wanted to learn English. I was not going to be able to learn Flemish thing, but I was very happy to write to them in English. And my mother really encouraged it because it was hard for her. She left Belgium in 1957 and left her family and that it was hard for her. And she, 
for her then to see that her sister's children were writing to her children, for her, it was really important for us to keep up that relationship. And I'm still friends with my cousins. And I think in part, it's because of the letters that we did exchange as children. And at first, maybe it was a little bit of a chore, oh, I have to write to my cousins, but it quickly became something that I looked forward to getting their letters. And, and I think they looked forward to getting mine as well. Sort of adds to a, um a sort of component of, of growing up together, even though you're very far away. Like you said, it brings that immediacy, um, even though you have a, you know, there's the chronological distance in time, but then which letters sort of bridge, but then there's also the, um, the distance because uh, you're totally right. I had a similar, um, similar experience growing up for myself um, with a cousin, which I guess she's like a second cousin. It's like my mom's cousin and then whatever our relationship yeah. is uh, in Norway. So same oh. age. Um, you know, but uh, farther away, obviously. Oh. So, or not far, you know, not far away from being, you know, it's in Europe, obviously, but you know what I mean. So. Yeah, no, Norway's far. <laughs> yeah. True. And were you ever able to meet that cousin in person? Yeah. So okay. um, we traveled in large part because, and it's actually funny now I think about it, my mom probably wrote letters to her cousin and they kept that up, you know, from, from family members before during World War II, especially to be concerned about the, their safety in, in Norway, right. you know, under um, Nazi occupation. And so there was, it's sort of, that was the impetus for the relationship, but then it kind of gets passed down. And then when I was probably 12, uh, we visited them. And uh, I don't know if it's as true now, but it definitely was true, um, like in the, the 50s and the 60s, that uh, the women were more likely to learn English be in Norway because uh -huh. of they would probably end up in something that required them to write to other people. So her husband, whose name is Bjorn, um, you know, and they're still there and we still keep in touch, but he knew like no English. <laughs> uh -huh. um, and, and, but Bjorg, uh, his wife and my mom's cousin does know English. And so what was, it, it was like, it started out as practice and family, but it also was interesting to see how, um, the, the act of writing was different than how you converse, right. but you still have that, you know, it's different. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, but you have that sense of familiarity because there was all those letters and packages and cards right. that were exchanged. Right. So. Oh, that's great. That's nice. Oh, Christine has okay. another question. I had a feeling there was another one brewing, so it's perfect timing. Um, did your son who was going to college at the time you were writing the book, um, write you fun letters the way um, James said, is it Seligman? Is that right? Seligman, yeah. Yeah, um, wrote to he, his mother or um, what were his letters like to you? Well, he barely wrote to me. I, I was telling Lauren earlier, he ended up not being a letter writer at all. I think he actually felt kind of some pressure because he knew about this book that I was writing. Um, my when I sent my second son off to college, I actually gave him postcards with stamps and the address. So I occasionally heard from him. Uh, third son, I heard from him. But my fourth is an amazing letter writer. And it's funny because he's, you know, the youngest. He's, he's someone who definitely did not grow up even look, like he didn't even learn how to write cursive in school. That's how young he is. But he writes me from college. He's the only one left in college. And he writes me from college. And when he, he was home for a lot of COVID, obviously, and I kind of missed getting the letters <laughs> because they were, they were such a special uh, insight into in, to his daily life. And they were like James' letters in that he talked about his class and, and his friends and he made jokes. And so, but for that son, yes, I'm getting those kind of letters. And what's funny is that now the brothers all know that's the youngest one will write the letters. So they've actually called him and said, oh, can you just dictate a quick letter to mom? You know, so she thinks I'm writing to her. So he takes down their thoughts and sends me a letter. I mean, it's crazy, but I am getting letters from the boys in lots of different ways. <laughs> oh, thoughtful though. I mean, it's funny. We were talking about scribes earlier, right? I guess yeah, he, he, is, the, he into... is the family scribe. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That is, that is so funny. Yeah. <laughs> it's it does. So do they um, dictate and then end up, does he send you letters like, and then they just like, he sends them out and then they come back to the house. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm like, where can someone explain this to me? And then you explain, I'm like, okay, I get it. <laughs> like, why is this letter postmarked here? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> That's so funny. 
or something. I mean, it's both physically immediate, right? And and um, yeah, it's just immediate in, in chronologically and geographically. So well, and the personality of both of them is represented in that letter. The one who is, you know, too lazy to write it himself and the what, yeah. So I have right. all, I, and I keep them all so in my green trunk. So I'm very happy. Very cool. Does anybody else have any any sort of final questions or thoughts? Um, if you haven't read the book, I would definitely recommend uh, reading it. It's it is a fascinating trip through. I think a thing that we sort of assume is very similar um, to, and it is in the sense that we call email. You know, it's mail, right? But it's it's uh, it's really not. Um, it's very different. So I would definitely definitely encourage you to pick it up. And it's a uh, it's funny you cover so much um history in you know it's not like a it's not a huge tome but there's so many things that really speak across the ages to letter writing which made it really fascinating to me so hey, really thank you yeah all right well thank you all so much for being here thank you nina thank you, for, thank for you everyone for coming and thank you lauren for hosting me this was really enjoyable thank yes. you all right thanks and everyone have a, a great rest of the night and a nice weekend yes all right thanks okay bye-bye bye-bye